Hi everyone, Dr. Wendy Costers, Professor of English, here to explain and help you understand Roland Barthes' very famous essay, Death of the Author. If you're an English major or in a literature class, then it is very likely that you're going to be assigned to read this essay because it is that important. And really, I think this essay brings up ideas that are beneficial for all readers, not just students. Because as a reader, you assume a very important role and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Here you are ingesting this material, thinking about it, interpreting it, questioning it, only to have somebody come along and tell you that your ideas about it are totally wrong because that's not what the author intended for you to think about it. Well, I'm gonna show you how to challenge this claim. Now, I've been teaching literature at the college level for almost two decades, and I always assign this essay when I'm teaching my classes because I want my students to recognize that they have a voice, that they have a say in the meaning of a text. If you are interested in getting help with the analyses of literature and writing and rhetoric, then please be sure to subscribe to the channel and join me on this new venture of mine. In a nutshell, BART belongs to the structuralist and post-structuralist, but all you really need to know for this lecture is that he's part of a school of thought that believes that everything is derived from something else, and because of that, our understanding of a text is dependent on the other things that we know and the things that influence the writing of that text. Since there is nothing original, Bart asks, how can we give a single person, this author, the authority over a text? The author is not necessarily the creator. He or she is simply managing or putting together ideas, ideas that already existed, into a more interesting, intriguing, newer, and or compelling form. He says, we know now that a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning, but a multidimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. If you've ever said, it's all been done and said before, then you're not wrong. But think of all the ideas and creations that are continually produced every day. These creations are just derivatives of old ones. This leads me to Bart's main point in Death of the Author. A major obstacle that holds a lot of readers back is the assumption that the author maintains full control over the meaning of his or her writing. Have you ever been in class and participated and said something like, I think the character is using this metaphor to call attention to feminist concerns, only to be told by your instructor that there's no way this interpretation could ever be valid because the author of the text was a total misogynist. Well, that stops you from participating, yeah? Your idea is suddenly put to a halt. Or do you ever find yourself needing to know information about the author, like his or her political attitude, beliefs, values, or circumstances to try to make meaning of a text? There's nothing necessarily wrong with getting some context, but it significantly limits your role as a reader and the meaning that you can derive from the text. And this is why Bart uses such an extreme word as tyranny when he says, the image of literature to be found in ordinary culture is tyrannically centered on the author. Now, this power and control that we so often grant the author is a modern concept stemming from points in history that revered the individual. Now, you have to keep in mind that prior to the 19th century, most people didn't care who wrote a text. In fact, many things were written anonymously. And if you were to pick up, like, let's say, a Jane Austen novel, it wouldn't say by Jane Austen. It would say by the author of Pride and Prejudice. And you didn't know who wrote Pride and Prejudice, but you did know if you liked that novel or not. And so you could base your opinion of this new novel on what you thought about Pride and Prejudice. But now we are so invested in the author and we seem to want to know everything there is to know about him or her. And we can do this with a simple Google search. But you should be careful of that. Barr warns us that knowing too much biographical information can set us up for misleading, limiting, or incorrect interpretations. Like when we learned that Van Gogh's madness began to take over around this specific time in his life. We may then begin to see only his madness in certain paintings when that may not be there at all. Essentially, Bart argues that when we put the author up on a pedestal, we devalue our significant role as readers. We are the ones who make meaning of a text, not the author. And that meaning is always changing and evolving based on attitudes, times, and circumstances that are always in flux. Bart argues that the birth of the reader comes at the expense of the author's death, meaning that once the work is in the hands of the reader, the author resigns all control and ownership over it. 
it no longer belongs to him or her. After all, think about the problems we create for ourselves if we allow the author to control the text. For one thing, authors themselves are human, so while they might intend one thing while writing the text, they may change their mind in the future. And if that's the case, which intention or interpretation of the text should we accept as true, best, or correct? What if the author explains her intention at the time of writing, but there's no evidence of it in the text? What if the text you're reading was written anonymously and you can't identify the author? What if the author left no notes on the text and he died 300 years ago? Does that mean the text meaning died with him and so the point of reading his work is pointless? You run into quite a number of problems when you give the author full control. I mean, one of the wonderful aspects of literature is that the meaning and the enjoyment of it can change based on the circumstances under which you are reading it. Consider how the context of your situation affects the way you interact with a text. Perhaps you have an English teacher that you just don't particularly like. This teacher forcing you to read a novel may influence the way you approach it, yeah? Or think about how much you've grown just in the past 10 years, how much your life and you have changed. So you might read Tolstoy's The Death of Ivana Leach while you're an invincible young 20-year-old. I'll bet you read that same story much differently as a 90-year-old. Nothing about the story changed, right? You did. Your circumstances and your perspective did. When I teach literature, I try to show my students how approaching literature through different critical lenses can significantly change the meaning of a text. For example, reading Charlotte Perkins Gilman's short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, through a feminist lens is far different than reading it from a psychoanalytic lens. Go ahead and check out my lecture on that as well, if you can. But if we were to give Gilman full control over the meaning of the story, then our role as, you know, and our fun as the reader really ceases to exist. Certainly, we can still read the material, but suddenly becomes a very objective, boring, and less stimulating activity. You would simply be seeking out the answers that the author had already determined, as though literature were an equation to be solved. But remember that literature is not an objective discipline. It's meant to be interpreted and subjective. And don't forget that literature could not exist without us, the readers. We are the ones who determine the ever-changing meaning of the text, as I said earlier. So this is the problem with students who are constantly asking for that final or right answer, the official meaning of a text. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. There is no one right answer. And that's because everything in literature is subject to interpretation. Now, that's not to say that some interpretations aren't stronger than others. No matter what, you always have to have real textual evidence to support whatever interpretation you have. You can't just say, this is the meaning because I feel that way. You must always be able to back it up with evidence that you can directly point to in the text. Some interpretations will always be more compelling or stronger than others, but it doesn't invalidate the other interpretations as long as you've got that evidence to back it up. This is how I want my students to approach literature in my classes, and I encourage you to do so too. While I certainly give my students interpretations of a text, it doesn't mean that they are the only ones or the right ones. One of the things that I base my courses on is having discussions and challenging each other because I do believe that literature is something to be debated. And ironically enough, remember that while you read Death of the Author, that Bart, the writer of the text, is also an author whose authority has died the minute that you began to read it. And with that said, share with me your ideas and thoughts on this theory, this essay, and how it may impact the way that you approach literature, art, ideas, philosophy, anything subjective from here on out. Thank you so much for joining me and be sure to check out some of my other videos for more help with literature, writing, and rhetoric, including an audio recording of Death of the Author. I hope to see you guys in those lectures.